Today's video is kindly sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. We all have bad days now and then, when stress builds up and we don't behave our best. Just the other day I found myself rolling my eyes and muttering under my breath at another driver on the road. And this morning, a politician's comments on the radio upset me so much, I had to put my cup of tea down quite firmly and leave the room. I didn't even finish my biscuit. But as shocking as these outbursts may be, they don't hold a candle to more extreme behaviour. You know the kinds of things I'm talking about. Rotating your head 360 degrees, speaking in a demonic voice, vomiting pea green liquid all over a priest. If you're the parent of a teenager, that might sound like an average Thursday night. But of course, what I'm actually referring to here are the scenes from The Exorcist, one of the most iconic horror films of all time. In case you haven't seen it, in The Exorcist, 12-year-old Regan is more than a little bit stressed out and poorly behaved, she's possessed by Satan himself. The normally sweet and delightful Regan turns violent and foul-mouthed, develops tremendous strength and becomes the epicentre of swirling and destructive supernatural forces. Scary stuff. But in the end, it's all just a bunch of Hollywood nonsense, right? Well, Catholic priest Father Walter Halloran would probably have partially agreed with you on that. He said a lot of what appeared in the film was inaccurate and exaggerated, but not because he thought the idea of a child being possessed by the Lord of Darkness was far-fetched. It was more that the events depicted in the film didn't happen quite how he remembered them. Now, if you haven't assembled an alliance of champions and commanded them for arena battles, dungeon runs, then what are you doing with your life? Because you're missing out on the greatest mobile game of all time, Raid Shadow Legends. Remember, you can use my links below to download Raid yourself to your mobile phone or PC. So I've been playing Raid for a while now and I've tried my luck against some of the most difficult bosses in the game, but everything is about to change. The newest boss coming to raid is the biggest and craziest yet. This thing is a hydra with six different heads. One of the heads, the Head of Blight, is a nasty one. It leeches your team whilst protecting its own. Then there's the Head of Wrath that gets angry. It gets so angry it gives itself a scary buff, Vengeance, that triples its attack power. There's so much to discover in raid, but personally I really enjoy the PvP arena. It's a great way to put all of my experience during the raid campaign to good use against other players. Raid's also giving away a super limited edition champion to every player in the game. It's esports legend and Navi superstar, Simple. Between now and January the 28th, 2022, Simple's limited edition champ is available for free to both new and old players in Raid. All you have to do is log in for seven days and he's yours. There's seriously never been a better time to get started. Hit the link in the description below or scan my QR code and you'll get an epic champion, Rector Draft. 200k silver, one energy refill and one XP boost and one ancient shard. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. But be quick, because all these rewards will only be available for 30 days. Once you're in, you can find me in game under the name 42. And if you're fast, you can join my clan. And it's that easy. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in game. You see, the inspiration for The Exorcist didn't come from a screenwriter's imagination. It came from real life events. Our story begins in 1940s America, in Cottage City, Maryland. A 12, 13 or 14 year old boy, depending on which account you read, is mourning the sudden and unexpected loss of his beloved Aunt Harriet. The boy, who would later become known by the pseudonyms Roland Doe or Robbie Mannheim, had been particularly close to Harriet, an active spiritualist. Spiritualism is the belief that people who die pass into the spirit world, where they can still be contacted by the living via a medium or a device like a Ouija board. Along with the practices of her faith, Harriet had taught Roland how to use this tool, and together they had tried to contact departed souls. When Harriet died in 1949, Roland was devastated, and reports suggest he tried to contact her through his Ouija board. Whether he was successful or not is unknown. 
but it seems he contacted something. Because it was around that time that things began to go wrong for Roland and his family. The does began to hear strange sounds throughout the house, including marching feet, muffled voices, and scratching noises emanating from the walls and floors. Furniture moved by itself and objects levitated. Without warning, water began dripping from pipes, and most terrifying of all, Roland's mattress began to move around of its own accord, like the world's least fun magic carpet. Roland also began to change. Before Harriet's death, he'd been a quiet, reserved boy. But in the time after her death, his behavior became increasingly erratic, with Roland acting aggressively towards those around him for no apparent reason. He also started to develop marks and scratches all over his body, seemingly out of nowhere. We know about these events thanks to an anonymous source who submitted a series of reports that ended up in several American newspapers in mid-1949. That person was later identified as the Doe family's former pastor, the Reverend Luther Miles Schulz. In these articles, Schulz described how the Doe family had taken Roland to see medical doctors and psychiatrists, but that no one had any idea what the hell was wrong with him. Schulz then arranged to observe Roland overnight and claimed to have experienced a range of effects that he attributed to dark forces. Scratching noises coming from the walls and vibrating sounds coming from Roland's bed. Blankets allegedly moved around the room and furniture tipped over untouched. It was at that point that Schulz, a Protestant preacher, suggested the family prepare Roland for an exorcism. But for that, they were going to need to bring the big guns, the Catholic Church. Exorcism, which involves evicting demons or other spiritual nasties that have taken up residence inside a human being or a place, has a long and varied history across many cultures and religions, from Islam to Hinduism, Buddhism and Judaism. In the West, exorcism is closely related to the history of Christianity especially Catholicism, although the practice apparently goes all the way back to Jesus, who, according to the Bible, performed an exorcism on a demon-possessed boy. The Vatican first issued official guidelines on exorcism in 1614, updating them as recently as 1999. As well as these rules, the Vatican has a small list of officially approved exorcists around the world but most ordained Catholic priests can get permission to perform the ritual if they so desire. One such person was Father Edward Hughes, a Roman Catholic priest who judged that Roland was the victim of demonic possession. According to Hughes, one telltale sign was that Roland couldn't keep his eyes off the Bible. Not exactly CSI level evidence, I admit, but apparently it was good enough for Father Hughes. According to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, you can tell if someone is demonically possessed because they have a superhuman strength, an aversion to holy water, or the ability to speak in unknown languages. Other potential signs include spitting, cursing, and excessive masturbation, which pretty much accounts for my entire class in secondary school. But there you go. Hughes recommended that Roland be taken to Georgetown University Hospital, where he was kept for three nights whilst Hugh performed a series of exorcisms on him. According to Father Hughes, those three nights were filled with unnatural events, and the process was eventually stopped when Roland broke free from the restraints holding him to the bed, snapped off a bed spring, and used it to slash open the priest's arm. After that, the family took Roland home, where things went from bad to worse. Red scratches started to appear on the boy's body, with one set of marks spelling out the word Louis. Since Roland's mother and her sister Harriet were originally from St. Louis in Missouri, Roland's parents decided the demon wanted the family to move there. Luckily for them, the scratches hadn't spelt out Greenland. Otherwise, who knows how the story would have ended. As you've probably guessed, things weren't much better in St. Louis, and the family had to go back to the church for help. The first person they spoke to was Father Raymond Bishop, the priest who would go on to keep a diary of events surrounding Roland Doe's apparent possession. 
Father Bishop signed up a colleague, Reverend William Bowden, and the two of them visited Doe at home, where they claimed to have seen objects flying around the room, a shaking bed, and Roland speaking in a guttural voice. The Archbishop granted permission for Bowden to perform an exorcism on Roland, and the boy was ultimately moved to the psychiatric ward of the Alexian Brothers Hospital in South St. Louis. There, Bowden was joined by another priest, Walter Halloran, who supported him in the exorcism. The process went on for several weeks, with the priests performing exorcisms on the boy every night. Why does something about that sentence make me feel iffy? According to Halloran, during the time, words such as evil and hell, along with other marks like a pitchfork, appeared on the teenager's body. Roland Doe was also described as having the strength of a fully grown man, and at one point, he broke Father Holloran's nose. He also hurled abuses at the priests, threatened them with violence, and offered them sexual favours, which just sounds like my local pub on a Saturday night. The ritual of exorcism was performed on the boy over 30 times before the priest decided to shift gears and baptise Roland. Accounts claim that this was the turning point, and that Roland Doe started acting like Archangel Michael, shouting, Satan, I am now Michael, and I command you to leave this boy now! Which kind of sounds like the priest had only succeeded in getting Roland possessed by something else, but apparently that was deemed good enough. The boy known as Roland Doe returns to his senses and went on to live a long and fulfilling life, untroubled by the irritations of demonic possession. Decades later, author William Peter Blatty recalled the newspaper reports he'd read about Roland Doe and used them as inspiration for his 1971 best-selling novel, The Exorcist. That book went on to inspire an even more successful film of the same name. But the question that remains is, was the story true? Even if we factor in the undeniable sensationalism that's included in the book and film, do the accounts told by Reverend Schulz's newspaper interviews and Father Bishop's diary hold even a shred of truth? Well, the answer to that question really comes down to whether or not you believe in demons, possession, and exorcisms. If you do, there's really not a lot to be said. People and places can be possessed by dark spirits, and when they are, crazy shit happens. But if you take a slightly more sceptical view, then if we're being honest, it's all a little bit hard to believe. Researchers and writers investigating the Roland Doe case have, perhaps unsurprisingly, arrived at the universal conclusion that there was nothing supernatural about the boy. He was either a manipulative teenager literally raising hell, or more likely just a deeply disturbed child which sadly is all too common when it comes to so-called exorcisms. The history of exorcism is littered with examples of people with a misunderstood mental illness being subjected to rites and rituals aimed at saving them from demonic possession. As recently as 2003, an autistic boy in Milwaukee died after being tied up in sheets and held down by church members trying to exorcise the evil spirits they blamed for his condition. An autopsy found that he died of asphyxiation. Then, in 2005, at a covenant in Romania, a 23-year-old schizophrenic nun by the name of Marisia Arena Cornisi said she'd heard the devil telling her she was sinful. With the help of four other nuns, a priest performed an exorcism on Cornisi that included binding her to a cross, gagging her with a towel, and leaving her for three days without food or water. She eventually died from a combination of a lack of oxygen and dehydration. And on Christmas Day in 2010 in London, a 14-year-old boy was beaten and drowned by relatives, trying to free him from the clutches of an evil spirit. The Vatican itself acknowledges that only a small percentage of exorcism cases are what it describes as authentic. Whatever the hell that means. In the case of Roland Doe, even Father Holloran, who was heavily involved in the exorcism, refused to go on record as confirming that Doe had been demonically possessed. During his investigation into the background of Roland Doe's story, Author Mark Opsonik 
found that most of the details were based on nothing more than hearsay and were never fact-checked. There was no evidence, for example, that the first priest, Father Hughes, ever visited Roland Doe's house or performed an exorcism on the boy. The documentation around the case is also thin and one-sided, relying mainly on testimonials of two priests, both of whom were believers in demonic possession and the power of exorcism. To quote the original trailer for The Exorcist, Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world, a world of darkness. But whether you believe that world is dark because it's governed by Satan, or because someone had forgotten to pay the electricity bill, is really just a question of faith. Thanks for watching.